tell you, Christmas comes, uh, I don't know, six, seven, eight times a year for me when former Congressman Dr. Ron Paul joins us. I think it's interesting that Larry McDonald uh, was a proto-Ron Paul uh, and was a medical doctor himself. And that's the type of folks we need to elect to Congress, not more lawyers. It's so great to see his son, an MD, uh, up there uh, in the U.S. Senate, Rand Paul, the leader of the Republican PAC uh, for president. Everybody I talk to says, oh, I want Rand Paul. We'll ask him about that coming up. We've got him for just one segment, just about 15 minutes here. Uh, but, uh, sir, there's so much to talk about. Today, I'd like to just cover the waterfront with you. Uh, we've interviewed Border Patrol head of their union. We've shot the video ourselves and broke it four weeks ago that the Border Patrol loads the illegals on the buses, including adults, and buses them to be dropped off to Democratic Party facilities to then be given voter IDs and welfare. Uh, this is the end of the country. I know as libertarians, we are for, you know, more open borders, but but not if we're bordering kleptocratic failed states. What is your take on this crisis uh, that Obama's clearly orchestrating and, and where it's going? Well, obviously it's a huge problem. I don't think there's one person with the wisdom that can wave a wand and deal with this because of all the all the intrigue going on, the mistakes made in the past, and the mess we have now, and kids coming in here. I, I thought of one thing, and this is uh, obviously tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, maybe these buses ought to be taken to Hollywood. It just, you know, let the Hollywood-type people who have promoted Obama for so long, let let them uh, see what, what's going on. But, uh, no, you're right. The libertarians have different opinions. Some are, you know, real diehard, total open borders, and others aren't quite so. But, you know, I've written that up in Liberty Defined pretty well the best I could on, on what it should be because, you know, if we live in a true free market, prosperous society, uh, there's usually a need for labor, and you want to be very generous about allowing people to come and go. But this whole idea of coming in illegally and then it's politicized because, uh, oh, one party wants them to be voters. And uh, also, there's, we're bankrupt. We have a welfare state. And, you know, I've said that, uh, you know, we shouldn't give them any freebies. And, uh, you know, free education and medical care. Then, you pay, then they paint you as being totally heartless. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's so complicated because the countries they're coming from, they're worse than ours. I mean, there's, you know, it involves the drug war. It involves, it, it involves dictatorships. It involves bad economic policy. And we have this now. I, don't, I think it's a sign of how bad our economy is and how bad our structure here is in this country because there's so much resentment. But it, uh, it is not, you know, the problems are not going to go away. But it, a better answer on the libertarian issue is my, my position there is if with the libertarians who say, well, you're not pure enough because you don't want totally open borders. And I says, are you sure that in a total libertarian society, which, of course, we're not going to see, but we can talk about, total libertarian society, government doesn't own the property. The people own the property. So the ranchers all in Texas would be the ownership, and they would have somebody, they would have something to say about intrusion on their property. And therefore, anybody who came in from an outside, you know, would be met by property owners, and they wouldn't be protected by the state. So I'm not so sure that if you and I and a few others had an island and we owned the island, that it would be open borders. <laughs> I would think that anybody who owns land on that island would have to be responsible and allow people to come in, but there wouldn't be a government. So this is a consequence of runaway government, the mess we're in, the economy that we have, the welfare state, and, of course, a lot of resentment has built up, and then you get it all politicized with, with a guy like Obama. Shifting gears, uh, you have predicted in your books, you have predicted for, for decades that the private Federal Reserve would ruin the currency and debase it even faster. Obviously, it had lost 99 you know, cents by now, um, and, and a lot of that uh, value since 1913, since we got the private Federal Reserve. A lot of that loss has happened just the last few years. We're seeing an acceleration. Now even mainline economists and analysts are mirroring um, your... Um, a breakdown dealing with the end of the dollar. Now we see China's yawn exploding. We now see uh, countries from South Korea to Russia moving away from the dollar. Saudi Arabia is starting to move away. 
Uh, it looks like that big event you've been warning about is getting closer and closer. Can you speak to collapse and uh, what's going to happen if the dollar does devalue, sir? Well, you're certainly right. It's getting much, much closer, and it's not just a few third world countries. Or, you know, in the past, uh, you've reported on it before, you know, when Iran and Iraq would do it, then they'd get punished. Oh, you know, you can't give up on the dollar. Don't take on the dollar. But now it's people like, uh, you know, the Germans aren't all that happy with us. I saw today that the French are pretty annoyed with us, too, you know, about, uh, you know, how we how we handle our monetary policy and how we treat the people, you know, with spying on them and all the rest. But this whole episode of uh, with Russia right now over Ukraine, it's probably the stupidest policy conceivable that we want to provoke a war with Russia, put on sanctions, and then they, they're not going to take that. And then all of a sudden, oh, you mean they can make an alliance with China and India? Uh, and, and they are. It's, it's, it probably takes a little while to do that, but that's what the plan is, and I think the numbers are coming together. I think Brazil wants to be involved with that, and it's a growing effort, because I think there's a build-up hostility with America, because we've been bullying the world, but they've, nobody's been strong enough to take us on, especially since the breakdown of the uh, Soviet system, that we've been the kingpin. So economically and militarily, nobody can say boo. But once they see that our economy is in trouble and they have a chance to do something, they get sick and tired of these sanctions that are put on countries because we tell them, nope, you can't talk, you can't trade with Russia, you can't do this. Well, I think when we start to slip as we are, I think there's going to be piling on. I think the piling on has already occurred, which means that we're closer to that point where there may be a precipitous fall. You make the right points. The Fed has orchestrated about a 98, 99% devaluation already, but it's still a dollar is a dollar today. What if you lose lose the rest of it and 100% uh, or a large portion of what we have left? That's a big deal. And if you look at all the currency destructions around the world, uh, the end stages go very rapidly. Most people remember now about Zimbabwe dollar, but they only remember the two or three months that it was in the news. But they had been doing that for for a lot of years, and then confidence is lost. Uh, there's still enough confidence in the dollar that tomorrow you're not going to read where everybody dumped the dollar. But I think there's central banks now buying up gold. You know, Russia... Russia mines it and they keep it. China buys the gold. India's always bought gold, and a lot of other people do. But, but the, our banks, uh, the Western banks, the European banks, and, of course, the United States claim that uh, there's no need for that. We're not going to buy it. But uh, who knows what they're doing behind the scenes. I suspect that they're, they're doing the same thing. That's right. Uh, Zimbabwe went in just the space of a year, about five years ago, and it's still bad from uh, inflation where it took a million of their uh, currencies to buy a loaf of bread to a trillion. We just showed some of those trillion dollar notes on screen and their answer was total totalitarianism. And, and as a historian, as a medical doctor, as a Von Mies Institute fellow, I know that you've studied history, but undoubtedly the establishment's rabbit out of a hat is the armored vehicles, the checkpoints, the NSA surveillance. They think authoritarianism is going to hold this together and their nukes are going to menace the rest of the world but then our own elite hate america the old america the the, the ideas of liberty they share that with the rest of the world that, that dislikes our imperiousness so it's a very bizarre mix of factors where the establishment's trying to shut off our power plants cloward and piven uh, our governmental systems bankrupting them in a power grab but i sit back looking at the wide spectrum and I see the elite undermining their own empire that gave them their power. So it, it really seems like a evil system that doesn't even know what it's doing, or does it? Can they pull a rabbit out of the hat, Dr. Ron Paul? No, uh, temporarily uh, they will. But uh, they think they are omnipotent because they get away with it for so long. But eventually, you know, the markets and the people catch up with them. You know, just yesterday, I don't know if you noticed, there was a hearing in the banking or the financial services committee about uh, auditing the Fed. Of course, they wouldn't use my bill to audit. They bring up with this crazy scheme that uh, they can do it by a formula. And as long as the Fed follows this formula, which is just another form of economic planning, and they did this because the Fed's 100 years old, and they said, now it's time for reform. But they were pretending this was audit, had nothing to do with audit, although they used that language. 
I sent in my, uh, you, you know, my dissenting views, and they did take them and they put them in the record, but they really didn't give it a serious discussion. And the, the, big, the big thing is, is the uh, Paul Brown, uh, uh, you know, uh, congressman has the bill that I had for a long time. He has 224 co-sponsors, enough to pass the bill, and they wouldn't even bring that bill up and contemplate it. They bring sure. up this other crazy thing of a price rule. A lot of economists say that it isn't that the Fed doesn't have a policy. They just lie to Congress and the public about what their policy is, and that they're already involved in a controlled collapse right now. And most economists I interview, a lot of them prestigious, say we've really been in a depression since 2008 in most sectors. Uh, Dr. Paul, uh, you've uh, given us a pretty uh, accurate prognosis going back decades ago. Uh, what do you think our current real economic state is? Well, I think it's in total shambles, and of course they uh, sort of, uh, downplayed that when I said in 08 during the, the 08 campaign that, that we were already starting in a recession. Of course, the Republicans were in charge, so that was a really bad thing to say. No, I think um, I, I certainly for uh, the lower half of our e economy, of our, our people, you know, the middle class and down, they're in a depression. You know, they're, they're, their standard of living isn't going up. And real income hasn't gone up since the Bretton Woods broke down. Since we went totally off the gold standard, real wages have not going up. Nominal wages do, but real wealth accumulation, you know, goes to the wealthy class deal in Wall Street. And even the Fed, uh, they haven't been shy about saying, well, we are going to interfere. We have a plunge protection team. We have to go in there and protect the markets. Well, all this uh, monetary inflation has gone to the market. But I think ultimately, and I think that's what you're suggesting, will they be able to protect themselves? A few maybe, but there's going to be a lot who have benefited by this. Uh, they won't know when to get out either, and it looks very, very shaky right now. I do not believe. You know, now they're saying, well, no more quantitative easing, and we're going to quit by October. Well, they, they don't have the biggest idea what conditions will be like in October. And uh, but they they claim they're going to quit quantitative easing, but they're not going to allow interest rates to go up. Well, that means they're going to print money anyway, and they'll buy something else. It's just that they're not going to buy any more exactly. long term bonds. So and then they're that always in the business of deceiving us. Exactly, and then that inflates the stock market. That's where the inflation's going, and, and people think it's really super valued, but it's not. It's actually just bought and devalued dollars, a very dangerous game indeed. You know, talking to you, who's obviously a very wise man, who's been a you know, Air Force, you know, a, a medical air corpsman, medical doctor, Congress uh, author, the whole nine yards. You're a smart guy. And if I was sitting there with you on the fishing dock, uh, just between me, you, and the fence post, and I said, Dr. Paul, where do you really think America and the world's going in your gut in 120 seconds? You know, let's say if you were talking to your grandson and you were giving them advice, really giving them the skinny, what does your gut tell you is going to happen uh, long-term to civilization? Well, long-term, I'm not as pessimistic as I am short-term. There's no way that the Congress, a president, or a few more members of Congress are in the Senate will all of a sudden be able to reverse this because the momentum is so strong, the debt is so big, that, excuse me, the debt has to be liquidated. And the only question how you liquidate debt is you don't pay it, which isn't the case uh, for a, cover, a country like ours. They always pay it, but they pay it with paper money and devalue the currency. So we're locked in. It's not going to change. We're not going to all of a sudden, oh, that's not going to quite so many wars. That's uh, this wean ourselves off of the welfare state and the warfare state. And, and it's uh, gradually go back to the gold standard. It's not going to happen. But where I believe is we're quite capable in 5, 10, 20 years from now of having a group of people who have been influenced by everything from radio shows to the Internet and all the things going on, Austrian economics, because it, there's been a, a tremendous amount of excitement and understanding of the Federal Reserve in the last five years. So since ideas do have consequences, it's worked in the past. So I'm holding out with a tinge of hope and conviction that if we st keep fighting the battle of ideas, that we will then influence enough people that they will only endorse a government that presents a case of freedom for the individual, get out of these wars, sound money, and maybe paying a lot more attention to the Constitution. RonPaulChannel.com, what is it like? 
and, and we're not talking about you here, but, but it's an example of success, and we need to try to model ourselves off of that and augment from it. What is it like to be a voice in the wilderness 40 years ago before you were even in Congress or before you were even you know, writing best-selling uh, novels and, uh, and, and, and stories and, and, and books uh, on economics? What is it like, though, to now see your son as a front-runner for president, uh, to see your ideas popular all over the world. You're a central figure like Alexander Solzhenitsyn was in the 80s against communism. You're as big or bigger figure worldwide. And I know you're not a narcissistic person, but what does that mean now that you've reached true global icon status? Uh, seriously, I mean, that's a testament to the power of taking action, of being a voice in the wilderness, of being Dr. No. And, and, and what's the main thing you want as a message to go out to the young people? Well, the message is liberty, but I think you sort of stretched it a little bit. I hope I participated and helped along, but a lot of other people have. I mean, you've reached a lot of people. You can't imagine how many people in a campaign trail. I said, when did you get interested? They would mention your show, and they'd mention Aaron Russo. I guess you remember Aaron. Oh, well. yes, good friend. We saw that document. So people come in, in, different, uh, in different ways. But, you know, back 30 years ago or 40 years, I'd go to college. I always did the same thing, but, you know, I'd get 20 people out to a little club or something like that. But I was very stoic about the, the whole thing. And right now, it's a confirmation. I see it as a confirmation that ideas are very, very powerful. There's a lot of allies out there. You know, if you look at the Mises Institute and the different uh, libertarian groups now have participated tremendously. In the 70s, and the, well, earlier than that, say in the 50s and the 60s, I had no place to go. There was no Internet. The universities uh, were jam-packed uh, with, you know, nothing but socialists and Keynesians. But today, you know, we have multiple organizations and a lot of books and a lot more professors. Mm -hmm. So it is quite a bit different. And I feel good that I've been, you know, part of it. But it takes a lot of people and... Uh, you know, I see the intellectual leaders, the Mises and Hayek's and, and uh, Rothbard and these people who wrote uh, and explained these things. I think a lot of us uh, have had a gut instinct of what is right because some people say, you know, Ron, I like what you say because it's so much common sense. I think a lot of people arrive where we are with common sense. But it's always good to get an intellectual like a Mises who can write and explain this, you know, in intellectual terms. And that's why I think this is real. I think the revolution is real, but you never know the outcome of the revolution. But right now, I think it's going quite well, you know. Sure. Uh, because, because, not only because the Internet's available to us, but because this system is going to fail. It's good that it's going to fail. Uh, the Soviet system failed because it was a flawed system. So we have a lot of opportunities, and that's why I'm still anxious to talk to as many young people as possible. RonPaulChannel.com. In the minute or two we have left, uh, former Congressman Ron Paul joining us. Uh, I wanted to ask you about impeachment of Obama. I get the Republicans did the same stuff. Uh, he's obviously gone further, and so we can impeach a bunch of them, Boehner, you name it. But if they get away with persecuting people with the IRS beyond Nixon, if they gets away with putting our military under NATO command, if he gets away with ordering the Border Patrol to stand down, if he gets away with all this stuff that sets a precedent, shouldn't we impeach, even though politically it might not get the Republican libertarians as far, because it's the right yeah, thing to do? It should be, but I don't know of any president that I would have in my lifetime that I would have been uh, a champion of not impeaching them, because so many of us have done the same thing. But the, but the Congress, it's the ideology that is so bad, it's what we have to impeach, because just think of what Congress has done, you know, to the presidency. They, we deliver, have, the Congress has delivered all this power. They allow them to go to war. They allow the monetary system to run roughshod over us. And uh, they turn all this uh, power over to the president, you know, whether it's trade agreements or, or whatever. All the regulations should be illegal. That's writing of law. So, uh, yes, Obama, I, I think Obama... Um, is, is worse than the rest. Not so much. He hasn't even written more executors, but, but he's so in your face about it. You know, it's, I will do it, and I have this National Defense Authorization Act, and if I think I have to assassinate somebody, I have the authority to do this. And, you know, he goes on and on. I'm good at killing people. Yeah, he to to do this. Most other presidents just did it and sort of did it quietly. But it, it's bad that he can be so upfront. It's almost like he's too honest with us, and the people are too complacent. They, you know, this guy's telling us what he believes in, and he believes in you know a dictatorship. So, um, but they've all done it. Uh, but it's just a lot worse right now. And as our
second wow. things get the worst, you're going to see more of that, unfortunately. Well, you can see him almost every day with incredible folks at ronpaulchannel.com. In the last 60 seconds, Rand Paul for president, he is the best. Obviously, he's clearly going to run. How do we get behind that? Uh, how do we get him in? Obviously, then he'll get blamed for what the socialists have done. So it's kind of bittersweet. But 60 seconds on Rand Paul, the senator, uh, becoming uh, the next president. Well, it's the same old story. You go to his website and uh, you, you volunteer, you send money, and you do all those things conceivable because... Uh, you know, it's a rough, it's a rough uh, road to hoe because, uh, you know, the establishment is going to come down hard. And he's, it seems like he may well be the front runner right now. But uh, if, if they think he's out there, believe me, they're going to come down hard. But it's just numbers. It's just numbers. You've got to have enough people because the media will not help. And uh, I, think he, I think he's getting a, a better shake, you know, from the media right now. But it's just going to have to be numbers Well, you know why the media already dug through all his closets, couldn't find anything, sent Democrats dressed as racist to his events to try to demonize him, that failed. I, I, I told Politico a few years ago when he won the nomination uh, for Senate, I said, look, attack him and then he'll lose. Only your endorsement will destroy him because people are sick of you and don't believe you. And so barring other things they could pull, I think he's got a real shot at it. And it's very exciting. And it's an example of how we fight tyranny generationally. Everything you've taught us. Dr. Paul, ronpaulchannel.com. Thank you so much for the time. And say hi to the family for us. Okay, Alex, good to be with you. Good to be with you, sir. Wow. Bye. It's always a great pleasure to talk to Dr. Ron Paul, who I've known since before he ran for Congress again in 1996. And I believe I'm one of the first people to ever interview Rand Paul because Rand was living in Texas then and uh, just gotten out of college and stuff and, 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 and hadn't even moved to Kentucky yet. This is about 19 years ago. And, and I remember uh, saying, well, no, dad was just on yesterday and we got a lot of support because the district used to be up to the south of Austin. We're on a big station in Austin and the top ratings my show did. And I'll never, I'm not bragging, it's just an interesting factoid story. And I said, and he, he was on a few nights ago, and it was really big. Uh, we'd like to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, try to get him back on, but he's flying around and stuff. Uh, you know, can you plug some more? And I said, well, why don't you come on? Oh, no, I can't do interviews. Somebody ought to dig that up. I believe I'm the first person to ever interview Rand Paul. And let me tell you something. I could care less about presidents, red carpets, crap like that. Uh, I'll guarantee if Rand Paul becomes president, he's not going to allow huge motorcades and traffic to be shut down. He'll fly around by helicopter or he'll just, I mean, the Secret Service is out of control. Uh, and I, I don't know, it's just so exciting to think they could put Rand Paul in there. And he'll play a little politics, you know. It's going to take that for him to get in there, but he's a good guy, I know him. And that's why they hated him so much and the big banks gave all that money against him and the rest of it. He just is super. And uh, I hope he becomes president. Now, obviously, they're going to blame him for what happens in the economy and the collapse. I mean, he might get elected and everything collapses and they blame it on him. But the, 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 the mainstream media is not dominant anymore. They're not going to be able to spin all that when it happens. And I just see all the planets aligning, not just for Rand Paul, but for the whole liberty movement worldwide. Because that's how God works. The evil's rising, but good is rising as well. And if we just take action, do the right thing, try to be good people, and say, God, I'm weak, just hold my hands up, you know, Help me go forward. That goes back to Jericho. You know, couldn't or who was it? The Bible couldn't hold their hands up anymore. So the people had to hold their hands up. Um, it was Moses. Yeah, you know, I, I guess it happened several times in the Bible. But the whole point is, is that that's how God works. And if you don't believe in God, the universe, whatever, those forces are real. Providence is real. And it isn't just like the secret that Oprah teaches, where you believe something and it happens. No, you believe it. If it's the right thing to do and you have courage, you might not realize it. It may be your grandkids that do. But it will have an effect in the universe. That's why the evil ones are always so busy telling you you don't have power. Because they're scared to death of good people. They're absolutely scared to death of the truth. They're scared to death of real male power, real feminine power. Not, not, not the state makes women powerful by destroying men. But men empower women. Women empower men. I mean, they're scared of families. They're scared of culture. They want to destroy us all. They're pure evil.
Jones here for InfoWars.com. We're going to be intensifying our efforts to awaken free humanity to the scourge of the globalist in the month of July. And starting this July 4th, we are going to slash prices in a celebration of true Americana, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence on all of the Made in America products that you will find at MadeIn1776.com or InfoWarsStore.com. We're talking about Made in America belt buckles in brass and nickeled brass that state it loud and proud. Molon Labe, that's why we have the best-selling Made in America men's and women's Molon Labe InfoWars.com shirts. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a win-win. You vote with your dollars. You support the most hardcore organization out there for promoting true ideas of libertarianism, constitutionalism, basic human empowerment. But more importantly, you get T-shirts and belt buckles so you can meet like-minded people. So you have a conversation starter with friends and family and coworkers. We are reaching out to each other. And you also throw it in the face of the anti-gunners and the rest of the parasites out there that you're a free man and woman and that you're not going to be a slave, that, that, that you're not going to be intimidated to shut up by their tyranny that they call political correctness. That's why in the month of July, we have got giant specials on everything at MadeIn1776.com. But to expand the info war, we're offering the biggest special in the history, what is it, 13 years of Prison Planet. Dot TV, our multimedia platform, we're offering the equivalent of more than five months free right now when you get a membership at PrisonPlanet.tv and you get 11 memberships that can be used with the same username and passcode so you can share it with friends and family. Now is the time to fund the war bonds. Now is the time to fund the info war. Now is the time to get aggressive. Now is the time to double down. Now is the time to realize you are the people that made the info war so successful and one of the leading lights worldwide against tyranny. You don't stand behind us. You stand right beside us. And I salute all of you on this July 4th, 2014 and going forward in the month of July and onward. This is about freedom worldwide and that desire for human dignity and self-determination that beats in the human breast. We are brothers and sisters together in the true spirit of liberty and the animating contest of liberty. And so I quote in closing the great Thomas Jefferson that I have sworn on the altar of God resistance against every form of tyranny. And never forget, if you are watching or listening to this transmission, you are the resistance.